Welcome to Tales from the Fandom, a podcast that brings a special guest out of the multiverse and straight to you. And now your host, David Ginsberg. Welcome to Tales from the Fandom. Our guest today is Eden Royce, who I first met across the gaming table during a session of Pathfinder, a game similar to Dungeons and Dragons. The only things I knew when I met her was that she was a great role player who had dabbled in tabletop role playing and a fantastic baker. Little did I know that she was, has done voices on several podcasts, is a published author with books such as Containment and Spook Lights. She also edits anthologies and is currently working as one of the writers on a film called The Seven Magpies, the first horror film anthology written and directed by Black or African American women. Welcome to Tales from the Fandom, Eden. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad to be here. So you and I met first at a role-playing game. Um, had you really been or done much role-playing before that first time that we met? I hadn't done a great deal of it before that first time. It, it, that must have been at least five years ago, if not uh, I Probably about six or so at this point. I, but yeah. I hadn't done a lot of it. I always wanted to because I've just been a lover of games since I was a child, board games, card games. And when I played them, there was always an element of role playing in those games. And I wanted to actually extend my reach and make the game feel more like an experience instead of just rolling dice or just turning a card. So that's right. what brought me to, to role playing. Well, I am glad it brought you to it. So that way I could get to know you because you are much more than just a person that was into gaming or as uh, as I found out through my stomach a fantastic baker <laughs> thank you so much I love baking it's it's one of my other I don't know if you would call it a fandom but I'm I'm a lover of the culinary arts as well so anything that is a cooking show or gourmet recipes or anything like that, then I, I've included that into my fandom scope. Now, who do you like as far as uh, like celebrity chef or person like a host as for as far as cooking shows go? Um, the ones I tend to watch aren't aren't always the competition ones. I'll watch a few competition shows, um, Master Chef UK, Master Chef Australia. Um, Master Chef Canada. It seems like every country has a Master Chef competition now. Right. Um, I also like Chopped, um, and I like Cutthroat Kitchen. Okay. All of those have just, uh, in addition to, I'm a great chef. There's also an element of luck of the draw, and there's also exactly. an element of um, trying to sort of plan and strategize as to how you're going to beat these other chefs. So I love those parts of the competition show, but I'm just as happy to watch a show that is half an hour or an hour of someone just doing a recipe from beginning to end. So I'll sometimes find those things on YouTube. There's a, um, a show on YouTube called Food Wishes, where Chef John, um, he doesn't like to show his face because he says his food looks better than he does. But um, you'll see close-ups of him creating a recipe step by step. And I love watching those because I feel like I can duplicate it. And he doesn't just give you the visual. You'll hear the knife go through something and you'll see and you'll be able to hear how crunchy it is. Okay. Like he'll make this amazing grilled cheese sandwich and he'll pull the two halves together. And you can see that cheese sort of pulling and, and coming away and making this almost little cheese web as you're separating the two halves of the sandwich. So it's not just a visual. It's also um, a full auditory experience as well. Right. The one thing that I always have problems with on cooking shows is when they bust out an ingredient and they're like, here is ingredient X. It's fantastic. Well, for me, 
I can't find that ingredient anywhere <laughs> at any of the local grocery stores. And if I do find it, I'm only going to use it for that one recipe, and it usually costs an arm and a leg to get. I, I've run into that, but... A lot of times Amazon may help you with finding whatever that ingredient is. Um, and I'm finding that more and more supermarkets are having a specialty section. And for me, justifying buying something expensive like, I don't know, black truffles or something or umami paste, um, find a way to incorporate it into your everyday meals. Sure, you can make that one recipe that they've shown on YouTube or whatever the social media site happens to be, but take the a slice or two of that truffle and dice it up tiny, tiny, really, really fine and toss it on top of your French fries the next time you make them with some a sprinkle of Parmesan cheese or something. I think it's mm -hmm. all about taking the elegant, upscale, possibly expensive ingredient and incorporating it into your daily meal choices. That is a good idea. Besides, what doesn't go well with french fries? That That is a question that I would have to ponder, and it would probably take a lot of thinking yes. to find something that doesn't go well with french fries. And if you find it, don't don't share it with me, because I don't want to know. You don't, want, you don't, <laughs> don't want french fries to be ruined. <laughs> I don't want my love of french fries ruined. Now, how would you describe fandom? Because fandom for you and I is, at least to me, a relatively new term that's been floating around probably for maybe the past five or ten years. It's not something that we grew up with. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I was a fan of Star Trek. I joined a Star Trek fan club when I was a preteen into my teenage years, but I had never heard the word fandom until probably about five or six years ago being used frequently. Mm -hmm. so how would you describe fandom from your perspective? For me, fandom is, is being into something so much so that it, that it becomes an integral part of your life. You make time for it. It's not just, oh, this movie is on, I'll watch it. Or next time I think about it, I will do a bit of research into that topic. You're actively seeking out new information on the thing that you're a fan of, and you're making it part of your life. All right. And besides cooking, what are you into? And I know I've mentioned briefly role-playing and that you're an author and have been on podcasts, but specifically. Um, I am a dark fiction and horror fan. Um, I will actively seek out books traditionally published and by indie authors that are in those genres. Um, I love black exploitation horror films. I always have. Um, I'm a huge fan of sci-fi, D and D, Dungeons and Dragons. I should clarify, and most games, whether they're board games, card games, role-playing games, video games. I also, as we've talked about, follow several cooking shows and trends in food. Um, and I love Hello Kitty. That will that will never change about me. Oh, Hello Kitty. <laughs> what what lies behind her smile? Oh, a range of things. A range of things. She's plotting to take over the world. Now I've I've never really been a horror fan, I must admit. I do watch horror movies occasionally with the lights on during the daytime, mm -hmm. and I make sure that there's someone in the house nearby mm -hmm. just in case. Um, and I always make sure to lock the doors at night extra carefully. Absolutely. Because I, I can't handle horror. So what draws you to like the dark fiction and horror like fandom? I I have to admit that I can be a, a little bit of a scaredy cat with certain things that are in the horror genre as well. I do screen the horror that I consume really carefully. Um, but when I was a very little girl, uh, I would watch these black and white horror movies with my mom and my grandma. You know, the sort of Bela Lugosi haunted house on the hill kind of 
mist covered lands types of movies where there would be a lot of intensity and a lot of drama, but not a lot of gore. All right. So I grew up watching those. And because of those movies, I always loved that sort of gothic element of horror and the, the mystique of horror. I always thought it, it, the creepiness of horror was what drew me in so that you could watch a movie, but then the next day, the feeling that you got from that movie wouldn't completely leave you. So it could mm -hmm. be the middle of the day, the next day, and you hear a creak and you're immediately transported right back to the night before where the heroine was fleeing for her life. Right. It was something that I felt was such a powerful medium. And as human beings, fear is very primal. It's something that we all have. We all have fears of something. And I think that horror and dark fiction has always been interesting to me because it's almost a controllable fear. And it's a way of trying to master that fear and compartmentalize it so that you can handle it, even if it is for a brief time. And you started off watching those as a kid with your mom and grandmother. I did. And now you have become a person in that fandom as a writer. Now I actually write horror for a living, which is an amazing thing to be able to say. Um, I wasn't sure five, seven, five or seven years ago that I would have been able to say that, but I've consistently tried to better myself and write work that was more and more visceral and more and more um, relatable to people because I think that the more relatable the story is, the more unsettling and chilling it can be for the reader. So, um, oh my gosh, I'm actually, a, I can call myself a, a horror writer now. It's an amazing thing to be able to say. Now, when, when you became a horror writer, how did you start off writing? Like what inspired you? What drew, what made you want to put something down in words for other people to read? Well, I think it came from my love of reading and I would read some books that were phenomenal and I'd read others that were less so, still enjoyable possibly, but didn't resonate with me. But I wanted to see my experiences in those types of books. Um, when I first started reading horror, there weren't a lot of people of color as characters in horror novels. And a lot of times when writers would portray certain magics, especially magics that I grew up around, like Southern Conjure magic, whether it's voodoo, root, conjuring, root doctoring, whatever you want to call it. Um, it wasn't always really accurate the way it was portrayed. It was always portrayed as this enormous evil that was coming to get whoever the main character was. Mm -hmm. And those conjure magics weren't set up initially to be just an evil method of destroying people. So I really wanted to bring my experience and my background to horror. Um, and I think a lot of times when you have an experience as such a young person, six, seven, eight, nine years old, watching black and white horror movies, watching gothic horror, watching gothic mystery, there's a part of you that builds up around that experience because it becomes a part of your memory and you associate it with positive things and you associate it with time spent with my family, even though I'm watching a horror movie. So I don't have negative experiences with horror movies. Mm -hmm. I have positive ones. It was almost a camaraderie of a time where I could be with my family and us almost be sort of on the same level, not necessarily mother, daughter, grandmother, but we're all 
were all females sitting here watching this movie. And it was one of the times I first probably can say that I felt like a grown up around my family. All right. Um, when you write your horror, do you get into a certain headspace? Do you have to do anything to get yourself from everyday Eden to the dark places that you write from? Um, when I was working full time, um, I had a job with a financial services company and I would come home, change into comfortable clothes, have dinner, and I would have a certain amount of time to do my writing before the need to sleep cat caught up with me. So then I really had to sort of almost flip a switch to be back into the, the mindset of writing, um, shaking off that professional demeanor. Now that I write full time, I'm able to construct my day in a way that is, I'm in front of the computer when I feel most productive. Maybe I've had a notebook with me the night before, woken up in the middle of the night with an idea that I've jotted down. Um, I'm able to be a bit more free with my time. Okay. And I can say, well, ordinarily I would have these three hours at the end of my work day to work. Now I have six, seven, eight hours a day, but I have my writing, I have editing that I do for other people and for other publishers. So it's now instead of when can I have time to write, it's now what part of my day is going to be for my writing and what part of my day is going to be editing for others. Right. Now, when you're editing with what you do, are you editing specifically in the same horror dark fiction genre or are you branching out into other um, aspects of the literature? I've edited dark fiction. I've edited horror. I've edited romance. I've edited steampunk. Um, I've edited several genres and I think you have to approach them differently. I, I love reading and I've read in all of those genres very widely. And I think as a writer and as an editor, it's important to do that. Not just so that you know what trends are, but also so that a lot of times you hear the, these are the rules of writing. And then you hear other people say, well, you need to break the rules of writing for your writing to be powerful. And I can agree with both sides to a certain extent. I think you do need to know the rules of writing and I think you need to know how to break them successfully. And reading very widely can help you with that. And you can find the writers who can use a comma splice and have it be effective. Whereas technically, grammatically, it's incorrect, but the sentence is so powerful that you want it to stay the way it is. So I think that as a, a writer and as an editor, or if you're thinking of even just writing that one story or that one book that you have inside you and never writing again, I think that it's important to, to read widely and to have an understanding about genre and what your genre tends to gravitate toward. Even if you completely break the mold, have a, a knowledge base to start from. Right. Now, when I opened the show, I did mention that you are one of the writers on a film called The Seven Magpies. How were you selected for that? I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> I got an email one day. I, I woke up, made a cup of coffee, wandered over to my computer, um, turned it on, and there was an email inviting me to participate in this a short film anthology project. And I thought, really? Me? And I think for a moment, I just thought, how did they choose me? Um, I think that it may be because I was featured in a book called 60 Black Women in Horror Writing. Um, that's by Samiko Salson, where she compiled 
the work and bios and uh, writing excerpts of several Black women that write horror and dark fiction. So um, that may have been a part of it. Um, but in all honesty, I don't know why they selected me. But regardless of why they selected me, I am extremely flattered and um, immensely overjoyed that they liked my work enough to to make it part of this film anthology. And your film, the film anthology, you are one of seven stories. Is that correct? I am one of seven stories, um, which will be seven films. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the last time I've spoken to the lead director, they took a tiny bit from a second story of mine um, because we sent in um, more than one story for them to select. Okay. So um, during the selection process, they liked two stories. So they said, well, we want to take a little bit from this one and we want to take a little bit from this one and then we'll make the film around both stories. So I said that was absolutely fine. So um, I'm actually looking forward to seeing the final product. I'm looking forward to honestly just seeing the screenplay. I, I don't know when that's going to be available or if I'm going to get a chance to see that, but it's my understanding that once it's translated from story format into a screenplay, that we will uh, have some input um, going forward. Okay. Is there any uh, scheduled release date yet, or are they just still in the pre, like pre-development phase of it? They're still in the pre-development phase of it. I. It's my understanding that the screenplays have been written or are close to being finished. Um, and from this point forward, it's getting approval for the scripts and then getting with casting directors, um, getting parts for these stories. Right. And going from now being able to say that you have written for a movie, you also just released a new ebook on Amazon. I did. Um, it is book two of my dark sci-fi fantasy novella series. <laughs> That's a big mouthful. Um, called Containment. And um, Containment is something that started off as a, I don't know, maybe a 3,000 word short story. And as I had people read it, they would ask me questions about, why is this happening? Or what would this do? Or how would your main character address this? And I realized that it was a story that needed more time and more space to grow. Mm -hmm. So um, I have finished book two. There's a book three planned. Um, those are all self-published currently. But what I was considering is um, once part three comes out, because those are all eBooks, doing a print version of all three stories together and maybe adding a little bit of new content um, in response to some of the reader feedback on what they would like to see with those characters. Okay. Yeah, the world is incredible. Like, when I read Containment, because I had seen the, the cover for it before it was even published yes. on Amazon initially because our mutual friends, um, Reese Ambrose and... Greg Allen had designed the cover. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Which is a fantastic cover. It makes you want to have that book on whatever e-reader you want to use. But once you dive into the story, the setting, like I would love to even just have a history of how uh, the city of Charlotte or even your world in general came to be using the... Um, spirits to power cities i've i've had several people ask me um because containment is a world where it's post-apocalyptic slash dystopian whatever term you'd like to use where the city has become so depleted of resources that in order to meet the needs of citizens um and their needs for power they had to find an almost bottomless resource for power, and they have decided to use spectral energy. Um, 
So my, our, my main character, whose name is Feast, love that name. He works for Charlotte Spectral Power. And that's one of his jobs is to oversee these containment units. And one of the suggestions I've had from a lot of readers is how did they go from what we currently use for, for power sources into using spectral energy that had to have been an earth shattering world changing um, phase that the city went through. So mm -hmm. that's something that I'm actually addressing um, in the print copy. Okay. So I think people would like to know that. How would that, how did that come about? How did they even find out that they could use spectral energy as a power source? That's always the thing that interests me about post-apocalyptic books or movies, television shows, is I'm always of the mindset of I would love to have more, even when it comes to things such as Waterworld or The Postman, mm -hmm. where you're dealing with it being hundreds or even thousands of years, and you just want that that backstory of, well, how did it change? How did it get to that point? What happened like in the immediate years afterwards? Mm -hmm. And like when I think about like the spectral energy, not only like how would the people in Charlotte or America or the world react to using spectral energy, knowing that it's from people that have died mm -hmm. or like, what are the ramifications? How do they transition? Like that's a major in infrastructure overhaul to begin with. Oh, absolutely. And then it's, it's just incredible that, to that you want like so many people want to know just to get get that backstory but feast is a phenomenal character i really loved reading his story and wanting more and i was so pleased to know that a second uh, book was coming out and i've got it i just haven't had time to read it yet no i completely understand i've um i've gotten to the point where i really feel like feasts storyline is an all-encompassing one um feast is a devil human hybrid who has not exactly found his place in the world yet and i think a lot of people can relate to that he's a bit of an outcast even though he just tries to be one of those individuals that i come to work i do my job i don't bother anyone but he finds himself always in the middle of, of some type of drama, some type of um, odd experience. It's like somehow these experiences are floating around in the ether and they find him and just sort of zero in on them. And I think people can, can relate to a character that's like that, that tries to do the right thing, tries to go through life without... Um, having any problems or having any issues with anyone and unfortunately those problems and issues just somehow land in their lap like every everyday life for everyday people exactly here <laughs> and all across the world yes except that feast has to deal with things that might not be stuff that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis yes i think on a day-to-day -day basis we don't have to chase down ghosts but um, you know, I think Feast is fairly capable, but you haven't read book two yet, so you'll see. Yep. Now, before we transition to a different topic, if there are books that you would recommend besides your own, what would you recommend to people as far as dark fiction or horror books that, that you would say, give an introductory experience into the stuff that you have grown up with or have enjoyed? I personally love folklore and horror. And I think to me, that's what horror needs is an injection of different settings, different scenarios, different um, mythologies to sort of draw from. Um, I would, I would probably recommend a, there's a British African writer named 
Nuzo Ono. Her books are fantastic. Um, I would start with The Reluctant Dead, which is her first novel. Technically, it's a collection of novellas, I would say. I believe it's three or four of them. Um, but for a lot of mainstream horror writers, you will experience a type of horror that isn't typically seen in the average everyday horror novel. I would say if you wanted something that was classic, I would get either one of the novels or short stories of, Daph of Daphne du Maurier. She wrote the novella that the movie The Birds was based on. Um, anyone who likes devils and demons and such with maybe a little bit of adventure thrown in, I call it hell noir as a genre. I would suggest uh, Reg Richard Cadre's Sandman Slim series and Mark Taylor's The Devil's Hand series. Both of those have devil characters or pseudo devil characters that are their protagonists, similar to Feast, um, but puts them in worlds where they have to interact with humans and sometimes the humans are actually the bad guys, not the devils. Mm -hmm. So I think those would probably be my recommendations if you wanted to start out in horror and ramp your way up to something that's a little more intense. Okay. Now, moving away from horror, we transition to science fiction or fantasy. Uh, what, what, like, what shows or movies are you into on that side of the fandom coin? Oh gosh, there's so many of them. I can't name all, but I think if I had to pick a few, I would say Star Trek for one, whether it's original series or next generation, whatever, whatever iteration Star Trek finds itself in, I am there. I, I've always loved it. I've thought it was a groundbreaking series at its beginning. And I think that it has continued to be that type of series that brings people that typically say, I don't care for sci-fi or I don't care for this type of uh, space travel exploration. Star Trek has focused a lot on characterization and it's also focused a lot on morality issues. And it's faced, it's focused a lot on modern day issues that people deal with. And I think that's the brilliance of the show. I also love, loved, I hate to say, Firefly. Mm -hmm. It was only one season with the follow up movie Serenity. But I thought it was an amazing cast of characters. And I'm obviously not the only one seeing as it has such an enormous cult following with mounds of t-shirts and collectible material from just one season. So I think that in itself says a lot about the impact that that show had. A lot of people out there that are fans of the show have still have hopes that somehow it will be picked up again. I don't know if that's going to be the case, but if it does, I will be there. Um, I also, <laughs> I also love Futurama. Okay. I, I know Futurama wasn't as popular as um, its older brother, The Simpsons, but I really enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed having an animated show that was irreverent and comical and in some parts just slapstick but also in those episodes there was a lot of accepting your crew for what they are for all their failures and all their foibles and how can you not think Zap Brannigan is hilarious or Zoidberg or Zoidberg I, I do feel for Zoidberg a lot of times um, 
because he's that character that I always have that sort of, oh, no one really, no one really likes him all that much. Oh, he's not that bad. So I, I do have a, a, a soft spot for the outcast character. I think I always will. Exactly. Um, you talk Star Trek and are you excited about the new TV series coming out? I'm excited about it, but I'm trying to be, I'm trying to maintain a certain level of calm in that excitement because whenever there's a new iteration of a series or uh, a franchise is a better word, I think, than series, um, there's always the risk that I won't be as in love with it as prior mm -hmm. iterations. So I'm excited about it, but I'm being a bit reserved until I see it. Okay. Um, a lot of times, even with a huge, with a huge franchise, even like Star Wars, people there was a, an enormous amount of talk and chatter leading up to The Force Awakens, and there were tons of people talking about what they wanted to see. There were tons of people talking about what wouldn't work, and when the trailer came out. Um, there were people that loved it and people that hated it. And I think that, and I have seen The Force Awakens and I do like Star Wars, but I, I think I'm firmly more in the Star Trek camp, okay. but I do like Star Wars. My husband is an enormous Star Wars fan to the point of, we finished watching The Force Awakens, let's watch it again, type thing. Um, and I wasn't sure how he would feel about it. But I think a lot of times people hesitate to have their franchise toyed with in their mind. Right. I was one of those same people with Star Wars, The Force Awakens. I actually refused to watch the movie trailer for probably a good three or four months before I actually watched it. Mm -hmm. uh, but that stems from, on my part, their changing of the the books that had been released for the past 20 plus years mm -hmm. the all the the books that everyone had based their their writings off of the expanded universe and those stories and they have basically shunted them to the side in favor of the six movies plus the um rebels tv series mm -hmm. Uh, they've in, they've started to include a few um, aspects of like the Clone Wars TV series, but the characters that I fell in love with over a long period of time aren't there anymore, and they've transitioned to the new characters of Ren and Poe mm -hmm. and Finn. And for me, it took a long time to even accept that. And then even watching the movie, it took me a few days to even decide well did i like that well i like the movie yes i like the movie but do i like it in the sense of the feelings that i got when i was watching the original trilogy and that's something that i still have discussions with with some of my friends about the the series and my my ultimate realization is i'm going to most likely need to wait and see the next two movies or the next three movies or however much many they produce and evaluate it as a separate body of work and then integrate it into what I love about Star Wars and see if I've liked the changes or if I'm just going to stay a curmudgeon and <laughs> you know preach my expanded universe where's my where's my uh, solo twins and Mara Jade I, you know, my feelings on that, not specifically Star Wars, but my feelings on new iterations with new characters, I do see, I do see it from, say, a, a writer slash producer slash director perspective of we have a new generation of people that we really want to get excited about these characters. So... I can also see it from a fan point of view where your first experience with Star Wars was that original series. And I still see it from the, 
oh my gosh, is are they going to be able to destroy the Death Star? What's going to happen? Oh my God, they're brother and sister. What the freak? So I, I do understand that original series and the power that those movies have. But I think that to a certain extent, you you eventually will have to either, one, to use your term, be curmudgeonly and just consistently watch the original movies, or just say, you know what? I'm going to see what they can do with new characters, older characters, um, because I really feel like the way that they handled Force Awakens is better than taking a storyline with the original characters from the original series and getting new actors to play old roles. I think people would have accepted that less. Right, exactly. And again, I, I do like Star Wars. I'm, I'm not the huge fan that some people are, but coming from a Star Trek lover world, I am more used to captains changing. Yep. So I think it's just sort of ingrained in me. I had the, whatever it is, the four years of Kirk. Mm -hmm. I had the eight to nine, 10, 11 years of Picard. And then there's all of the other iterations of Voyager and Deep Space Nine and Enterprise and all the movies and all of that. So I've... I've rolled with the captain switching and I've rolled with the crew changes. So I'm yep. a little bit more used to that than people that are diehard Star Wars fans. But I do understand um, there was something announced recently that they are doing a stage production again of Rocky Horror Picture Show. But what they're doing is they actually, they have Laverne Cox from Orange mm -hmm. is the New Black playing Frankenfurter who is actually a transvestite or a trans right. woman, I should say. Um, and a lot, and that was an incredibly divisive announcement. There were some people that just went, no, I'm never going to watch this because Tim Curry is Frankenfurter. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And then there were some people that went, oh my gosh, I think this is a great thing that you're putting a trans person in this role. Right. Um, and I could see it from both sides because yes, I've seen Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yes, I've seen it more than once, but I'm not, I didn't want to dig my heels in and go, no, you can't redo it because as wonderful as the original is, I'm sure that people that are from the LGBTQIA community Wanted, really wanted to see a person that was actually a trans person playing the role of Frankenfurter. Mm -hmm. As wonderful as Tim Curry is, um, I can understand the need for real representation in roles. Um, similar to what a lot of people are talking about right now with movie whitewashing, with Scarlett Johansson playing um, the lead role in Ghost in the Shell. Um, with the Doctor Strange movie that's coming out. Mm -hmm. um, or with uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. Exactly. From M. Night Shyamalan. There's there's a lot of... There's even the movie um, The Girl with All the Gifts, where in the book, um, her teacher has these deep rolling waves of, of jet black hair that's crinkly and curly and corkscrewy. And when they cast the movie that isn't the character that they've chosen. So I can understand people wanting to see Rocky Horror Picture Show reimagined with someone that's actually, I don't, I don't wanna say necessarily have a stake in the show, but mm -hmm. have the experience of going through life as a trans person. I can understand that. Um, I can understand that I can actually understand the other half of it, which is the fandom half of it of no, this is the original. No, you shouldn't mess with it. No, you shouldn't do anything with it. And I get it. 
And a lot of times my feeling is that the original is best in a lot of situations. But again, I can point to at least two distinct times where I do think the remake is pretty dang on successful. Um, Star Trek The Next Generation is one of them, mm -hmm. and John Carpenter's The Thing, which I think is a brilliant movie. And yes, it's a remake. And yes, I think I actually like the remake better than the original. And there are those times where that happens. But I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand that when they take something like Star Wars, where how old were you when you saw Star Wars the first time? Nine? Probably about eight or nine. So it had that impact on you because you wanted to be in that fight. You wanted to help. You wanted to, well, maybe you wanted to join the dark side. Who knows? But you wanted to be involved in that conflict. And I think that kids that are eight and nine want to see characters that they can see themselves in which is why i appreciate what the force awakens has done with having women having characters of color and even going back to the model of because force awakens i think was very much more similar to the original series or the original three movies, the original trilogy, mm -hmm. than any subsequent movies. It was basically, let's get in there, let's blow it up at the end of the day. And I think that was going back to what people loved about the original series or the original movies. Let's get some people in here that are complete underdogs. They don't have the best technology. They don't have the numbers that the dark size that the dark side has but they got the job done and i think that's at the end of the day what people really want to see they people love to champion the underdog at least i know i do <laughs> exactly now you mentioned that you loved firefly mm -hmm. and i have to say that made me so happy <laughs> because the amount of people where I've brought my DVD set over when I found out that they had not watched it, I would make sure that they sat down and we watched it together or we watched it over the course of a few weeks and they loved it. Everyone that has watched Firefly has, or at least from on my side, when I've gotten people into it, they love the show. Yes. Um, I've had a similar experience with the people that I've introduced the show to or that I've actually even shown them an episode or two. I think it was one of those shows where it was pulled or canceled before the network really sort of had an understanding of how huge it could be for them. Um, but... I think the unfortunate thing was the Fox network doesn't seem to be the network that really loves and promotes and sticks up for their sci-fi. Mm -hmm. They ran a show for one season. I think it was called, oh, it was the one with Kyle Urban and Michael Ely. I don't know if you ever saw it. Um, I'm going to have to actually look it up. I think it was called Almost Human. Okay, yep. I, I believe that might be the show. Uh, and that lasted one series. Um, I actually just looked it up, but from November 17th through March 3rd of the next year. Yep. So not even really a full series. Yeah, that sounds about like a half, like a mid-season replacement that they're testing the waters. And I feel like, for whatever reason, Fox just doesn't believe in sci-fi or doesn't believe in speculative fiction as a strong impetus for a television show. Um, I think it's also where they struggled with Sleepy Hollow. Mm -hmm. 
because I think they thought Sleepy Hollow was going to sort of go the way of Firefly, go the way of Almost Human. And it became such a huge phenomenon. And it was a black female police officer and Ichabod Crane of the actual Sleepy Hollow legend fame. And they had this great on-screen chemistry, but it was still very much a professional sort of relationship with a few sort of close moments of, oh, are they? Right. And I think that was the appeal of the show. But as it became more popular, the show began to change. And they began to take the focus off of the two of the lead characters and put the focus on other characters. And I don't know why they did that because I remember being in, because I was a huge fan of the show myself. I remember being in live tweets, um, watching the show with other people at the same time, mm -hmm. talking about what we wanted to see for the show, what we would support, what we would love for the storyline to take, where we would love to see the characters go character arcs. People got into this show. This show had a fandom, a strong fandom. And unfortunately, for whatever reason, the writers, the network, who knows really what happened, but the TV show broke down. And as of late, I would say within the last month, they killed off the main black female character and we most of the fans of the show were just horrified i'd unfortunately stopped watching the show because it became apparent to me that the people that loved the show and wanted to actually see the tension between ichabod and abby um, were in the minority because the network and the writers started focusing more on um, his wife who died, um, and some other characters and other side uh, plot lines. And I, I just sort of drifted away from the show in favor of other things. And I think that unfortunately the popularity of the show has now diminished in those circles because it be it began to grow a very large female fandom. And sometimes I think that certain networks that are and certain genres that are typically male dominated don't mm -hmm. know how to handle a female fandom necessarily. Right. I did remember seeing, because I had watched the first few episodes of Sleepy Hollow. It was a show that I was definitely interested in watching, but it never had time for. Mm -hmm. And I remember what it must have been, what, a month a month or two ago, whenever the, the character that you're talking about did die, mm -hmm. that a lot of my friends that were into the show basically said that they were done with it, that yes. there was nothing that they were going to do with the show anymore. Absolutely. And I just feel like, what else do this, does the network need? Because I remember doing these live tweets and there were writers from the show live tweeting along with actors from the show, along with writers, I mean, readers, watchers of the show, talking about, this is great. This is amazing. This is what we want to see. I would come back time and again to see this. So mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what else the writers or the network need in order to make a show that people really want to see. I can understand that five, six years ago, writers and the network didn't have this feedback. Didn't right. have social media to go, oh, well, what do we do next? We've kind of written ourselves into a corner. What do we do with this plot line? I understand that. Because as a writer, I've written myself into corners before and gone, oh, God, ugh, what am I going to do now? But you actually have an active community of sleepyheads, which is what they were called, mm -hmm. 
that you could have either polled, who would have been happy to answer, or you could have just lurked on social media and saw what people wanted to see, what upset people, what angered people, what would people want to come back for more of. Right. So I, to me, with you having that information, you made a choice to go against what the fans wanted to see. And I don't think that it necessarily paid off in that instance. Yeah, that is that happens to to a lot of shows too. I know that I was a big uh, person into Once Upon a Time. Mm. I loved, I love the story. I know it's Disney and ABC, which Disney owns, mm -hmm. and that they basically took from Fables, uh, the comic book. Mm -hmm. to design the show or because because there was a fables tv series in the works i don't think it ever got off the ground but i loved once upon a time for the first set first and maybe second season but after that it became so convoluted and well everyone's related to each other and the redeeming moments that uh, the evil queen has and now she's good but oh nope somebody has wronged her and now she's going to reject everything that they've worked on for an entire season to return her back to being evil but nope the next episode she'll be good again and things like that it just kills me and i just i don't understand because a lot of times i looking at numbers from say, the original trilogy of movies for Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yes, it made it an, an enormous amount of money, but more money was made in merchandising, T-shirts and toys and games and all of that sort of stuff. And with the popularity of, of merchandising and swag for TV shows, if you can keep a TV show popular give the majority of watchers what they want. I understand you can't please everyone. Right. I think that you could have opened up marketing for um, a television show that goes into syndication. Something like Supernatural. Supernatural has an enormous following and you can find Supernatural t-shirts and coffee mugs and board games just about anything you can find with Sam and Dean's face on it. Mm -hmm. And I think they could have had something like that with Sleepy Hollow. Oh, absolutely. I loved, um, when I first watched the first episodes, I loved the, uh, I, th I think her name is Abby, yes. the police officer. Mm -hmm. I loved her. She was probably my favorite part of the show. And I think that's what... I read something somewhere, um, and it isn't just about people of color. It's people of um, people that have certain disabilities, people that have um, other challenges, people that are larger or heavier than society, quote unquote, deems appropriate. Those people are starved for images of themselves. Mm -hmm. People of color are starved for images of themselves. People of size are starved for images of themselves that are positive. And I think that Abby Mills gave black women, and to a certain extent, women of color, a strong character to get behind and to root for. Um, and I don't know why the network just sort of went in a completely different direction, but... Um, they just, I think they killed their opportunity to be the next Supernatural, because I think they could have easily done that. Absolutely. They, they, they had the, the, the writing for it and the stories to go along with it from what I had been reading and what my friends had been telling me about the show. It's just hard to, to see a show where it has such a strong opening like or strong first season or second season and then have it stumble or whatever the powers that be make those decisions and it just 
goes downhill from there. Mm -hmm. I, I completely understand. And I know that sometimes the, the networks just, they get into a, a mindset of let's shake things up or let's get some different things in, but it's similar to publishing in that they want things that are slightly different but that reference things that have already been popular and already been successful and have already made money. Right. So that they can say, well, this will be like this already successful franchise. That's how we're going to market you and sell you because the people that have purse strings, they want something that they feel is a guaranteed sell. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that with the number of television shows out there that are repetitious or that are derivatives of other shows, I think it's time to sort of take a leap. Even with publishing, there are, I read a lot of indie authors and they have some amazing storylines and some really creative, new, fresh ideas in what fiction and speculative fiction should be. And those are not the things that are getting referenced when people mm -hmm. are looking for new television shows and when people are looking for new movies. And that is a crying shame because there's so much good out there if people take the time to find it, whether it be a book, um, even something posted online, a TV show that people may not have heard of. I mean, there's just incredible work out there that you just never see. Even like when I'm on Netflix at night when I'm working, there's movies that I've never heard of. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to watch that. The The synopsis sounds pretty good. And I'm blown away. Absolutely. And a lot of times it is, I think, about the marketing campaign because there are some movies out there, TV shows, books even, that are fantastic, but for whatever reason, don't have the marketing momentum behind them to really get them seen. Well, I think we're almost done with our time here. So if people are wanting to look you up, where should they find you? My website is EdenRoyce.com. And that's R-O-Y-C-E. R-O-Y-C-E dot com, E-D-E-N. My blog, where I mention my new work, things that I have in process, and review books and movies occasionally, that is Dark Geisha, D-A-R-K-G-E-I-S-H-A dot WordPress dot com. I'm also on Facebook and I'm on Twitter both under Eden Royce. I have an Instagram account that's under Eden Royce, but I have to admit I'm not all that great at updating it, but I'm trying to incorporate it into my social media um, a little bit better than I have been in the past. So any of those places you can find me. And what's coming up next for you besides Containment Book 3? I am doing a another collection of my Southern Gothic horror stories, Book Lights 2. I expect for that to be coming out sometime around January, February of next year. I have two short stories that I'm submitting to anthologies this year that I've amazingly actually been invited to write for, so I'm excited about that. Those will be coming out before year end. And I have finally written myself a novel that I'm looking for either representation for or looking for a publisher for. So hopefully I'll be updating my website with I've got an agent or I've got a publisher for that. And um, it's one of the stories from Spook Lights, um, Doc Buzzard's Coffin, that I decided to expand into its own full length novel. So that is coming out hopefully sometime soon. Well, that is fantastic news, and I will definitely be on the lookout for everything because, as I said, once I have more time for reading, your stuff is right on the top of the pile to get to. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it greatly. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule, especially with the five hour time difference that we have to uh, talk with me. And I hope to have you back as a guest in the future. I would love it. Let me know and I'll be happy to join you. All right. Thank you so much, Eden Royce. And that is it for this edition of Tales from the Fandom. My name is David Ginsburg, and it has been my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>